The carnivore community hates me. The ketogenic community hates me. The vegans don't like what I'm saying. You can give someone a diet of pure white sugar and rice and their diabetes gets better. You get less, significantly less benefits from working out if you use mouthwash before you work out. So like you want these gut flora, you want these bacteria in your mouth that produce nitric oxide, you just want healthy populations. There's essentially zero evidence that carbohydrates cause insulin resistance. Paul, it's great to have you back on the show. A lot has changed in a few years since we chatted. I'm excited to get into all those nuances, talk about what those are and why the changes. So I want to start off by talking about the diet piece. This is probably the biggest one, the one that has the most controversy around it. And I'm excited to learn more about it. So you last time we chatted, you were carnivore. You were carnivore MD on Instagram. I saw you recently change that to Paul Saladino MD. So let's start there and talk about that pivot. Yeah, I mean, I think probably I was trying to remember exactly when we talked last, but Probably not too long after that, I started incorporating carbohydrates into my diet. So I started incorporating sugar, quote unquote, from honey and fruit into my diet. And the reason for that was that, so my backstory is that maybe four or five years ago, I was in my residency in Seattle at the University of Washington, and I had really bad eczema. And I had had eczema for many years, on and off trying to figure out what was causing it and was eating a pretty healthy quote unquote diet. I was eating salads, olive oil, nuts, seeds, fruit, grass fed meat, maybe a little liver here and there, mushrooms, mushroom extracts, things like this. And even with that healthy diet, having cut out processed foods, I was still getting eczema flare ups to the point that the eczema got really bad. And I thought, okay, I gotta figure this out. My immune system is still not healthy. Even if it's just a skin rash, it means to me there's some sort of chronic immune activation going on below the surface, and I didn't want that. So that was the beginning of carnivore, which was strictly an animal food diet. So animal meat, animal organs, animal fat, and salt, basically for a year and a half or so. That was really interesting to me because when you do that, it triggers a whole bunch of people because in the nutrition space, as we talked about last time, people believe that red meat is one of the maybe forbidden foods for humans, something that we could maybe eat a little bit of from time to time, or we shouldn't eat it at all if you listen to Harvard. Um, and that the fat that comes with it, the, the, the saturated fat that comes with it is not good for humans for a variety of reasons, according to the mainstream narrative, raises your LDL cholesterol. And yet when I did that, I felt better and my eczema got better. And I thought, well, this, there's something to this. And then you find, or I found this community of people many of which had had similar sort of autoimmune diseases that got better when they cut certain foods out of their diet. A lot of them were cutting foods out that many people consider to be healthy. Things like kale or broccoli or spinach or oatmeal or beans or lentils or couscous or grains. And I thought there's something interesting here. And as a physician, I'd always been interested in, in what was causing illness and what were the big movers. Now, fast forward my journey a year and a half, Long-term ketosis resulted in some electrolyte issues for me. So this is part of the interesting journey, right? The humbling piece of it all, that the eczema gets better, the autoimmune condition gets better. Really, it was eczema and asthma, this whole atopic cluster. But then I get all these issues with ketosis, or presumably related to ketosis. And this is electrolyte insufficiency leading to muscle cramping when I'm climbing in a rock gym palpitations when I'm sleeping, trouble sleeping in general. I was waking up with hypnagogic jerks, which are when you fall asleep and you feel like you're falling and you wake yourself out of sleep. It's pretty, pretty horrible. And that's likely related to a magnesium deficiency. So what I learned in the process was that though the ketogenic community, I think is really well intentioned, a lot of the ideas around it are not fully formed. There's this idea that insulin is bad for humans. And I think the ketogenic community leans hard on this idea of insulin-induced insulin resistance. And I see people, this is an idea that really hasn't gone away. There's some pretty well-known influencers now who are also still talking about blood sugar spikes and how you don't want blood sugar spikes. And I think, okay, this is interesting because that's exactly what you don't have on a carnivore diet. Your continuous blood glucose monitor is about as flat as it can be, but it leads to pretty big problems for people. So what I realized leading 
back to that point and looking at the literature was that, oh, insulin is valuable in humans. And this postprandial, after we eat insulin spike, is essential for human health because it actually signals to the kidneys to absorb, to hold on to all of these minerals and electrolytes that people on low carb diets are just wasting. And that in the ketogenic community, you see people just taking massive amounts of electrolytes, massive amounts of salt to try and hold on to those. So that was sort of my learning and then adding the carbohydrates back to my diet. Not all carbohydrates, so not things like grains, not beans. I didn't really even do roots or many complex carbs. It's mostly just fruit and honey. Things have gone a lot better over the last three years since then. So no more muscle cramps, no more heart palpitations, testosterone back to normal. And I show my blood work all the time on my podcast. My total testosterone is between seven and 800 with like a really good sex hormone binding globulin level, which was actually elevated on a ketogenic diet and comes down when you add carbohydrates. So all sorts of things get better when you add carbohydrates back. And so now the carnivore community hates me. The ketogenic community hates me. The vegans don't like what I'm saying. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great because it means a lot of good conversations come out of it. Well, there's a lot of nuance to what you just shared there. And I want to really get in there and, and fish it out. And I'd like to start with the electrolyte piece. It sounds like that was a big part of you hitting your wall and making a dietary change at that point. Before you started to really up the carbs and include the honey, did you think about or did you try including more electrolytes through a product like Element, thinking of going the supplement route before the food? Oh, I tried it. It doesn't work. You don't hold on to it. Without that insulin signal to the kidney, you just waste it. So I was supplementing magnesium, I was supplementing potassium, I was supplementing sodium. It's just sort of like a losing battle. And then I added carbohydrates from fruit, fruit juice, and honey, and moderate amounts of sodium in sea salt are enough to hang on to all the minerals. So you don't waste calcium, magnesium, sodium, chloride, and other things. You, don't, you just don't waste them when you have an insulin signal. These blood glucose spikes are actually beneficial and they're part of normal human physiology. And as I suggested earlier, nor do they lead to any degree of insulin resistance or human pathology. This is, I would say, a signal of abundance for our bodies as humans. And you can see that on my blood work. My fasting insulin is lower now than it was when I was a carnivore. My fasting blood glucose is lower and my hemoglobin A1C is also lower. A really interesting piece of this for me as you talk about the insulin is the fact that it seems like this diet worked for you for say about a year and a half. And a lot of people coming to a keto diet, carnivore diet, and are getting these healing benefits, lowering the insulin. Are you open to the idea that when somebody is metabolically unhealthy, coming to a diet like the carnivore diet for a period of time, bringing that insulin back down and getting metabolically healthy, and then getting to a point like where you're at now, where you're including more carbs, is there any validity in that? Because we see that working with a lot of people. And you talked about this. A lot of the quote unquote experts are talking about using the ketogenic diet to heal insulin resistance. And it is working for people. So is it just the fact that it's only working for a certain period of time because people are so metabolically unhealthy and then they need to pivot? So there's, there's an important piece here to really flesh out. There's essentially zero evidence that carbohydrates cause insulin resistance. Removing carbohydrates is valuable for some people when they are insulin resistant because the process of insulin resistance, that pathology, leads to broken metabolic machinery. So you can't really use carbohydrates well when you're insulin resistant, when you're metabolically unwell, but the carbohydrates didn't get you there. So yes, it totally makes sense and there is a utility to Say you've got, you know, a car that runs on gasoline and electric and the car gets broken and it can't use gasoline anymore very well. Like, yeah, there's a, there's a point to just like, okay, let it use electric for a little while and so you can fix the gasoline engine. But the gasoline didn't break the gasoline engine. I'm sort of stretching this metaphor. Like the carbohydrates don't cause insulin resistance, right? They just are not processed well by broken metabolic machinery. So you can remove them. The other thing to understand is that you can also just fix your metabolic health without completely removing the carbohydrates in the first place. You can just lower the carbohydrates. Again, your engine is not going to run on these very well. Your metabolic machinery is broken. And we can talk about why I think 
people become insulin resistant because that is probably at the center of our modern epidemic of chronic disease. And it's not carbohydrates. It's just not. Even, I mean, there's nuance there, but it's not carbohydrates. It's not things like fruit. It's not things like honey. It's probably not even things like white potatoes. Those don't make people insulin resistant, even though I'm not a fan of them. It's something else. So I think that if you have a broken metabolic machinery, yeah, you can lower it. I think people actually do better with 50, 90 grams of carbohydrates rather than zero grams of carbohydrates per day if they want to get low carb or moderate carb. But I think, yeah, there's, there's some time period in which you can lower that and then increase it eventually and do better. I think people run into trouble when they start to believe that the carbohydrates are the problem. And it's not the removal of carbohydrates that really fixes the insulin resistance. So that, that is something I would disagree with. Removing carbohydrates doesn't fix insulin resistance. You're removing the, the fuel that can't be burned, right? But the insulin resistance is more at a cellular membrane level, a mitochondrial membrane level, and that gets fixed over time when you eliminate, I think it's the omega-6 seed oils, the omega-6 polyunsaturated oils that are the problem there. That takes a little more time to change out. So there's ways to accelerate that perhaps as well. But that's, that's the perspective that I have on it. This right here is my favorite protein powder, the 100% grass-fed bone broth protein from Paleo Valley. It comes in three flavors, unflavored chocolate and vanilla. The chocolate and vanilla you can just mix with water. They taste incredible just like that. And I like to take the unflavored, scoop it in my black coffee, mix it in. I barely taste it, but I'm getting that collagen and protein boost. These protein powders have been third-party tested for over 40 different herbicides and pesticides. They've come back negative. There's no chemicals or solvents used in the processing, just water. As a viewer of the show, click the link in the description to save 15% off this protein today. Again, this is my favorite protein. I know you're going to love it. All right. This is really fascinating. I want to take some time and really get into it. And you left us hanging for a while there and then got into it. And I really want to get into the nuance. So it's not the carbs that are causing insulin resistance. You've touched on it, but let's get into the physiology of why the seed oils, what I'm hearing from you, are is these are at the root of insulin resistance. Do you know who Walter Kempner is? No, I don't. So he's an interesting fellow, kind of a controversial guy from the 1940s and 1950s, maybe the 1960s. He's a physician who did a bunch of studies with diabetics, people that were morbidly obese, morbidly obese. We're talking hundreds of pounds obesity. If your team wants to find like, images, you can see the study. So he has this thing called the rice diet. And in the 1950s and 1960s, he put people on a very, very high carb, very low fat, very low protein diet. It was essentially white sugar, so sucrose, and white rice was the majority of the diet and they got better. They lost, I mean, some people went from like literally being round to being thin. Their diabetes got better. So he fixed diabetes with a very high carb, very low fat, very low protein diet. And it was by necessity, it was low protein because it was all carbohydrates. And the problem is that the human brain doesn't want to do this. Like, so he's controversial because in order to get his patients to do this, he had to like, he had to do some crazy things to cajole them. And so I'm not condoning his experiments, but the science is, is interesting. And what it says about human physiology to me is, is very compelling that you can give someone a diet of pure white sugar and rice and their diabetes gets better. Why does their diabetes get better? And this is not even short term. This is long term. So that in the span of, I think it was four to six months, he could then liberalize these people's diets and their diabetes did not return. So this is really interesting to me. And I think it kind of ties into the seed oil piece. And I'm not suggesting that this is a, a reasonable therapy for people because what we know about human physiology and the human brain is that if you try to push any of the macros too far, our brain really rebels. Humans seem to be able to lose weight by cutting carbohydrates or cutting fat. If you cut both of them together, you have what's called rabbit starvation. And you can lose a lot of weight very quickly, but it's very stressful on the body hormonally. If you cut carbohydrates, you have a ketogenic diet. If you cut fat, you have a low fat diet. And if you look at the trials head to head of low fat or low carb, they both have about the same amount of weight loss. So there's some contention, but it doesn't really look like a ketogenic diet is magical for weight loss. It doesn't look like a low fat diet is magical for weight loss relative to keto. They both work. But 
when you cut both, when you cut the, the fat really, really low, that's interesting to me. And this is what happened in the rice diet. And they, the, the fat was so low that these pro people were probably becoming fatty acid deficient. And there's a fatty acid that you can measure in the human blood. It's called mead acid, M-E-A-D. And that's an indication of fatty acid deficiency, essential quote unquote fatty acid deficiency. And so the hypothesis is that one of the reasons this diet might have worked is because when you restrict fat that much, the cell has to turn over those cell membranes in a different way. And that probably causes a lot of these polyunsaturated fats that are stuck in the cell membranes to become mobilized and turn over. The human body doesn't make polyunsaturated fats. But if you feed someone carbohydrates, the human body can make saturated fats and monounsaturated fats. But this is essentially an accelerated way to get rid of what were potentially excess polyunsaturated fatty acids in these people's cell membranes. Again, I don't think this is a good therapy for humans because it's so hard on the brain. Humans don't want to do this. We sort of gravitate toward like a third fat, a third carbohydrates, and maybe a third protein, depending how you're looking at it. Maybe a little less if you're doing grams or calories, but there's some balance of those things that kind of is what our body tends to. If you go too low fat, your body will rebel. And you know, if you go too low carb, your body's like, I want some carbohydrates. So the indication here is there's something going on in these cell membranes, and there's a massive shift that happens in the cell membrane when you get very, very low fat. And I think that's having to do with this turnover of these omega-6 fatty acids. So there's a couple of ways to do this without going so low fat. You can also just get them out of your diet, like extremely intentionally, and then do more fats that are saturated in their place. And so this is the part where it gets a little bit cumbersome for people to think about, but I think that you can get similar results by just having a low linoleic acid diet. So let's back up for a moment, talk about linoleic acid. Omega-6, which means that six carbons from the end of the molecule is the first double bond. It's an 18 carbon molecule. It's polyunsaturated, which means it has multiple double bonds. And there's a small amount in ruminant fat. So things like cows or goats or bison or lamb, sheep, deer, small amount, one to 2%. But animals like humans or pigs or chickens that are monogastric, accumulate linoleic acid. So the more of this fatty acid we eat, the more we store. We don't have a way to get rid of it like cows do. Cows can transform it. So it, where do we find linoleic acid in the human diet? We find it in chickens and pigs that are fed corn and soy, so evolutionarily inappropriate diets. And you find it in nuts and seeds, plant foods. And we have a massive input of this linoleic acid into the human diet now because we're feeding our animals corn and soy, things that they've never eaten historically. And all of our processed food is combined, is added with these seed oils, things like corn, canola, sunflower, safflower, soybean, grapeseed, these are all seed oils. And they contain between 25 and 65% linoleic acid. So what you have, I think, is an evolutionarily inconsistent amount of linoleic acid coming into the human diet. And just like pigs, just like chickens, when we eat corn and soy, when we eat foods, when we eat seed oils that have a lot of this linoleic acid, we store it. And I think that over time, it accumulates in our cell membranes and in the membranes of our mitochondria, these little powerhouses in the cell, and causes problems. And we can get into how it might cause problems at the cellular level if you want, but that's kind of the, the 15,000 foot perspective that we have this, this fatty acid that is in our food supply historically, but when we are living in a quote, naturalistic way in the forest, in the jungle, there's really very limited access to foods that are high in this. It's very hard to get the amount of seeds that you would get even in three to five tablespoons of seed oils. So I've done some content about this. You look at corn oil, for instance, or rice bran oil is an even better example. Chipotle, very, very popular. And I went to Chipotle and I asked, what do you cook your food? And they said rice bran oil. So it's the oil extracted from the bran of the rice. Okay, they put three to five tablespoons of rice bran oil into a, a bowl, like a burrito bowl or a burrito with the rice and the beans and the, the meat that are cooking in there. To get three to five tablespoons of rice bran oil, you'd have to eat something like three to four pounds of rice. So something that humans would never, ever do, right? It's the same with sunflower seeds. Sunflower seed oil is in almost everything. Soybean oil is very common. Corn oil. To get three to five tablespoons of corn oil, 
you have to eat somewhere between 60 and 75 ears of corn. So you can see here that we have now, even if we were eating an occasional sunflower seed from a sunflower plant, because we're starving as humans historically, or we're eating a little bit of rice and getting the oil from the bran, or we're eating some corn in Native American population, we're never going to get anywhere close to the amount of linoleic acid coming into our bodies in 2023. And really, this amount has been increasing massively over the last 100 to 110 years in the human diet. So I think it's a very interesting thing to see, okay, linoleic acid is just massively increased in our diets. It gets in our cell membranes, it gets stuck there, and then it causes things to kind of shift in a negative way metabolically. Does that make sense? Yeah, a lot there I want to dig into. So just to make sure I have this correct, when it comes to our metabolic health and insulin resistance, you're saying the root of that is this linoleic acid that's getting taken up because we're consuming too much of it, primarily through seed oils. They're becoming part of the cell membranes and they're, for lack of a better term, gunking things up, which I want to get into what's happening there in, in a few minutes. But before I do... I want to be clear on linoleic acid. It sounds like there's a little bit within animal products. Is that small true? Amount. Yeah. Okay. Small amount. So it's not like we're looking to totally eliminate it. It's just about the ratio. It's way off. We're getting way too much. Way, way too much. And you can look at the amount of calories from linoleic acid in your diet. You can even do something like chronometer. And if I put my diet into chronometer, you can see how many calories you're getting and all the breakdown of the micronutrients, it'll tell you how many percent of your calories are coming from linoleic acid or coming from omega-6, which is mostly linoleic acid. And when I do that, it's usually below 2% of my daily calories. The average American is probably upwards of 10 to 12% of their daily calories. Maybe even 15% of your calories are from linoleic acid. So it's, it's easy to measure. And if you look at one of those programs, you can see, but it's, there's a difference. And if you look at hunter-gatherer populations, this has been studied. It's, it's never more than like two and a half percent of their calories from linoleic acid. It just doesn't exist in nature. It doesn't exist. The only exception might be something like the koi san in Botswana when they eat the mongongo nuts. But you can also see that when they eat the mongongo nuts during that season, they also become more fat. So it's like, it's, it's the one hunter-gatherer population that in the last 30 to 40 years that they've been studied is doing this behavior where they're eating a huge amount of nuts they're probably eating the nuts because their hunting lands are being encroached on. They can't hunt animals and it's one of their survival foods. And you can see that they're getting more linoleic acid than other traditional hunter-gatherer populations. But when they do that, their metabolic indices, at least ostensibly, seem to suffer. But you look at populations like the Hadza, who I visited in Tanzania, they're not getting linoleic acid from anything except animal fat. They're not eating any seeds unless they're starving. They're obviously not eating any seed oils. They're not eating any chickens or pigs that are fed corn and soy. So it's very rare in nature. All right, well, let's continue the story. So we know linoleic acid is getting incorporated into cell membranes, gunking up the cell. Let's talk about now the physiology of how that leads to insulin resistance. There's probably a couple of ways. So most people would agree that insulin resistance is caused by broken fat cells. So it's the adipose tissue, I believe, that initiates insulin resistance in the periphery, at the liver and at the muscle primarily, but everywhere, really. And the way that that happens is because of these lipokines, these signals that are sent out from the fat cells when the fat cells are broken. So the fat cells are very smart. We think of fat as just like a bag of fat, but our fat cells have nuclei, they have DNA, they have mitochondria, and they release signals to the rest of the body and so what appears to happen is that when you stuff the fat cells first with too much linoleic acid, they can't divide. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger. This is hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. So hyperplasia is when a tissue divides and you get more cells. Hypertrophy is when one cell just gets very big. Like you think of hypertrophy like a, like a bodybuilder gets a big bicep, but your fat cell just gets really big. And so there's lots of evidence that these products of linoleic acid breakdown, which are unique to linoleic acid and don't come from anywhere but linoleic acid, things like 4-HNE, 4-hydroxynone and all and others, are like intimately connected with breaking fat cell division. There's articles that have that exact title, you know, 4-HNE leads to fat cell dysplasia. So you get these big ballooning fat cells 
because of these products of linoleic acid breakdown, 4-HNE and others. And then the fat cells can't divide like they're supposed to. It kind of breaks their normal cell division and they start leaking inflammatory mediators. They leak fat signals to the periphery. They leak lipokines. And then you get essentially increased levels of fat in the blood. And you see this in a lot of conditions where you have non-esterified fatty acids in the blood. And that signals to the muscles to become insulin resistant. And this is similar in some ways to what happens when you don't eat carbohydrates. Because when you don't eat carbohydrates, you have more non-esterified fatty acids in the blood. The difference is that you don't have broken fat cells on the back end. You just have fat cells that are signaling to the muscles, hey, don't take up glucose because we're trying to conserve the glucose for the brain, the testicles, the ovaries, the adrenals. It's like this physiologic insulin resistance. But in pathologic insulin resistance, you have these fat cells that are doing this all the time. And an insulin signal can't turn that off. So insulin is not necessarily anabolic. It's anti-catabolic. So insulin is meant to signal to those fat cells to stop releasing these non-esterified fatty acids. But when they become insulin resistant, when the fat cells become insulin resistant, they, they just release these things all the time. All the time, they're just spewing out these mediators saying, be insulin resistant, be insulin resistant to the liver, to the muscles. And so your muscles become insulin resistant, your liver becomes insulin resistant, and that leads to all sorts of problems. And that is sort of the genesis of what we see in metabolic dysfunction, diabetes, prediabetes. At a deeper cellular level, people also believe that these, not as these, these linoleic acid molecules become incorporated into something called cardiolipin in the mitochondrial wall. And this may have to do with why the fat cells get broken at the level of the mitochondria. That these mitochondria have these, I think there's four tails on a, a cardiolipin molecule. It could be three, but it, I think it's four. And they have these fatty acids on, on their tails and they're at the curves of these inner mitochondrial membrane, these cristae. And when they get overly populated with linoleic acid, it probably creates changes in the way the mitochondrial membrane works and that may cause mitochondrial dysfunction. So ultimately, it looks like excess linoleic acid is causing changes in cellular signaling, leading to broken fat cells. And that leads to inappropriate signals to the rest of the body. And we have good models of this happening. There's actually a condition called Dunnigan familial lipodystrophy, and it's a monogenic condition of insulin resistance. So it's monogenic, it's one gene. It's a gene called LMNA. And these people have insulin resistance because of one gene mutation, and it causes basically they're, they look very lean, but they have tons of visceral adipose tissue and their non-esterified fatty acids are through the roof because they're just spewing out all these mediators from their fat cells into the blood and they get profound insulin resistance. And with that, they also get accelerated atherosclerosis. So accelerated cardiovascular disease. Interestingly, people with Dunnigan familial lipodystrophy don't have elevated LDL. They just have profound insulin resistance and they get aggressive cardiovascular disease. All right. So putting this whole puzzle together, coming back to the ketogenic diet, lowering carbs, lowering insulin. We know that this does work, but again, coming back to what you said before, this isn't getting to the root of the problem. It's a workaround. So we're not denying that that can be a workaround and you can use that as a tool. But what you're talking about here, changing up the cell membranes, getting the proper fat in, that's getting to the root. Exactly. Exactly. So we know seed oils are a big part of the problem here. We know that animal products contain a little bit of this linoleic acid, but not enough that it's actually an issue. What about oils like coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil, ones that get a pass in the health and wellness space as being good quality oils? How do they fit on this spectrum? Yeah, so this is really interesting. So you can really just make a continuum of the amount of linoleic acid in any oil. So butter, tallow, 1% to 2%. Coconut oil, 2%. You see a big jump when you go to avocado and olive. And it can be anywhere from 8 to 20% linoleic acid in both of those. So some olive oil is 8%, some olive oil is 20% about the same for avocado. It generally ends up in the 12 to 14% linoleic acid range for those oils. They're better than seed oils because they're not refined, bleached, and deodorized. So to get oil out of a corn granule, right, you have to crush it and squeeze it and heat it 
and extract it and use hexane and bleaching agents. To get oil out of olives, you just press them. I mean, you can do it on your counter. You can just smash an olive in your hand and you'll get olive oil in your hand. The problem with avocado and olive is not the way they're prepared. The problem is twofold, in my opinion. The first being the most problematic piece, which is that they're often adulterated. Because these are more expensive oils that are becoming more in vogue, if you look at the literature, there's clear evidence that both avocado and olive, more than 50% of the time, are cut with seed oils. And very often, their peroxide values, which means their oxidation levels of the oils, the fatty acids in there, are higher than preferred, meaning that they're, they're old. So when you look at a fat, you have saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, and polyunsaturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats are the most likely to oxidize. They're the least stable. The more double bonds, the more unstable a molecule is. So people may not know this, but omega-3 fatty acids are the least stable of any fatty acid because they have so many double bonds. So I think that humans benefit from omega-3 fatty acids in foods, but I'm not a fan of any sort of omega-3 fatty acid taken as an extraction. And some people will say, but I have this bottle of fish oil and it's a bottle that's open to the air. It's like a, you cannot have a bottle of fish oil open to the air. That's massively oxidized. That's just not, a, it's just, it's too fragile. You can't do that. Even if you put it in a capsule, it's fragile enough that it's going to be highly oxidized. So if you want to get omega-3 from fish, it's fine. I think there's plenty of omega-3 for humans and things like egg yolks, animal fats, even tallow, like beef fat has plenty of omega-3. That's a whole separate conversation. So omega-6, this linoleic acid, returning to that, it's going to oxidize quite a bit. And that's a problem for humans in a big way. So you're going to get oxidation of olive oil. You're going to get oxidation of avocado. Theoretically, if you know people in Italy and you're there when they're pressing the olive oil and those are organic olives and you're not heating it and you're packaging it in glass, it's probably pretty benign for humans. But again, I think that there is some argument to be made that if someone is metabolically unwell and you want to be metabolically healthier, healthier sooner, the, the speed with which you approach that metabolic health is probably proportional to the amount of linoleic acid in your diet or inversely proportional, if you see what I'm saying. Kind of like the rice diet people. I think if someone is unwell, they would do well or they would be better served by having the smallest amount of linoleic acid possible in their diet, right? And cooking with olive oil is not a good idea because you shouldn't heat an oil that's that fragile, nor avocado. But look, I want to make it, I don't want it to be impossible for people, but ideally speaking, I think if someone is unwell, you'd want to have the smallest amount of linoleic acid possible in your diet. And avocado and olive are not great for that because they have more and they're often cut with seed oils. They're often oxidized and kind of rancid. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm just trying to picture somebody in a position like you talked about that's trying to, I guess a good analogy would be doing an oil change, almost like you're doing an oil change for your car where you're trying to switch out the linoleic acid in your cell membranes for better fats. So we know on one extreme, we have the rice and the sugar diet, which is going to be changing that up the quickest. But say there's somebody that cuts out the seed oils, they're eating whole foods, they're taking these other oils we're talking about, olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil out and switching up to tallow. How long would it take to change that up and to renew their cell membranes? We don't have great data here. There's one paper on the kinetics of changing the cell membranes, and it suggests like two years. But I think that it can go faster if you just clean my clinical observation and suspicion is that it can go faster if you do those things. Now, I think most people are going to get some, they're going to get some olive oil, they're going to get some avocado oil. And if you really want to get like brass tacks here, it gets to a point where people, it's not popular because you have to look at things like what is the chicken that you're eating. Now, chicken is generally pretty lean. So you're not going to get a lot of fat from that chicken. Poultry, lean. Duck, sometimes more fatty. And duck is the same way. If that duck is fed corn and soy, it's going to have more linoleic acid in the membrane. 
pork is probably a problem for a lot of people because if people are eating pork, they're usually eating fatty pork, particularly bacon. And so if you really wanted to do this quickly, look, bacon is a meat. It's way better than other foods, in my opinion. It's better than processed food. It's better than seed oils. But bacon can have 15% linoleic acid in it also. And then you're getting a lot of fat in that bacon because it's really fatty. So it's never popular when I talk about getting rid of bacon from your diet. But I think that that can slow the progression for some people because linoleic acid comes from seed oils. It comes from, you know, olive oil, avocado oil, chicken and pork fed corn and soy, which is 99.5% of all chicken and pork. And it, that, those are the major sources. Even eggs, unfortunately, can have significant amounts of linoleic acid if the chickens are fed corn and soy. And this is sort of just this discordant place that we find ourselves in, in the universe, in, in our planet, in 2023. It's hard to find chickens that are fed bugs, right? It's hard to find pigs that are wild and not just fed corn and soy. Those are the types of animals we would have eaten. You know, if I'm in Tanzania and we're hunting a bush pig with a Hadza, the animal's not eating corn and soy. If you look at wild pigs, the fatty tissue is four to five percent linoleic acid. The same for chickens and other fowl, right? Four to five percent. But you put those things in captivity and you feed them grains, 15, 20 percent. It's crazy. So again, if someone is metabolically healthy, maybe not a big deal. But if you're unwell, if you're obese, if you're diabetic, pre-diabetic, and you really want to get fast, you want to get healthy as fast as possible, then I think there is some there is some benefit to thinking about getting that linoleic acid as low as possible, at least in the short term. And then it's kind of like the carbohydrates, right? Maybe you do a low linoleic acid diet for four to six months, and then you can liberalize and have olive oil on your salad or whatever. I mean, we can talk about salad. That's a whole separate conversation. You want to have some olive oil? Fine. You want to have some avocado oil? Fine. You want to eat some regular chicken? Okay. If you want to eat some bacon in six months, fine. But it's just, I think that there is a way to approach that level of balance more quickly. And it just depends how intentional and how detailed people want to get. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I can imagine for a lot of people that are eating healthy and they want to make steps in this direction, like we're talking about, an area they'd really need to address is eating out. And that's controversial of whether that could even be considered healthy because there's so many oils that are used in cooking that we're unaware of even when we're at these quote unquote healthier restaurants and eating eating, you know, meats and some of the things you'd advocate for. Most of the time, if you go to a steakhouse, they're just going to cook that steak on the grill every once in a while. Cause I do this a lot when I go to cities, I'll go to restaurants and ask them what they're cooking in. And if they're cooking chicken on a grill, on a griddle, on like a flat top, they might be cooking chicken in canola oil or sunflower oil. If there's a sauce, it's likely that sauce is going to have some seed oils in it. But if you're just getting a steak, the majority of the time, you're pretty darn safe. Steak is pretty safe. A lot of time it's cooked in tallow or it's just cooked on a grill. So I think that makes it, that makes it better in a lot of ways for people. It makes it easier to get that, you know? One of the pieces of your work that I really appreciate, and you've touched on this, the fact that we can't just look at what we're eating, we have to go all the way back to what that animal's eating when we're having proteins and animal products. I find a lot of the people in the carnivore world are big on consuming meat and aren't necessarily always concerned about the quality of that meat. And one thing that comes up in your work time and time again is to be aware of what these animals are eating and how that changes the nutrient profile of that food for us. Talk more about that and the importance, because again, this is something that's really central to your message. Yeah, this is interesting. So as much as I don't want this to be an impediment for people, and as much as I believe that making any intentional change in your diet is going to improve your health, I do think, I do hope that it's also valuable to give people a North Star and to give them an ideal way for a diet to look for them to shoot for. I don't want it to be unreachable. And so I think that that ideal situation of diet is eating plant foods that are organic. I predominantly eat fruit. I eat exclusively fruit, but whatever plant foods people want to eat, those would be organic. 
the honey that I eat is glyphosate free. So it's from farms that are organic and not near any place that's spraying glyphosate. So that's important to know about your honey. The milk I get is raw. And again, this is all just the North Star. If we can create the ideal situation, the milk is raw. And hopefully those cows are fed grass exclusively. And hopefully those cows are raised on land that it doesn't, isn't sprayed with pesticides. And the meat and organs that I eat are from grass-fed, grass-finished cows. So as I mentioned earlier, the interesting thing about cows and also bison or deer or elk or antelope is that these are ruminant animals. And if you feed a cow corn, it's not really going to increase the amount of linoleic acid in the fatty tissue significantly. The problem, as I see it, with corn-finished cattle, that's cattle that's raised on grass and then finished the last three to four months of its life on grains, is that these animals then accumulate everything that's in that corn. And that corn can be moldy. That corn can have microplastics because a lot of this feed is low quality. And that corn almost certainly has pesticides. So if you look at the muscle and fat tissue of grass-fed, grass-finished animals, there are two things that you notice. Grass-feeding, grass grass-finishing animals leads to lower amounts of pesticides and toxins in the meat, whether it's hormones, whether it's pharmaceutical drugs, whether it's mold toxins, whether it's microplastics, glyphosate. And there are some nutrients that are significantly higher in that type of meat. So you're basically taking a, a cow and that's an herbivore and you're giving it its ideal diet, which is more nutrient rich grass, something that humans can't eat, by the way, we cannot eat grass, toxic for humans because of the amount of silica. So cows can take this grass and make it into valuable meat and organs for humans. And you're replacing that in a significant amount of the cattle grown in the US or in the world with inferior quality food. And anyone that's ever been to a nice restaurant or is a foodie in any way, shape, or form, or likes good wine or good chocolate or anything can appreciate that quality matters. And the reason that quality matters is if you like nice cars or whatever you like, right? Quality matters. And so the nutrients in a food are often reflected in the taste, the complexity of the taste, and that's, that's significant. So if you've been to a really nice steakhouse and you had grass-fed meat at a steakhouse, which isn't actually that, it's not served that often at steakhouses because it's leaner. But if you've had a really good grass-fed steak or you've had a good, I don't know, honey or good milk, you know that there's a difference in quality when animals are fed what they're supposed to be eating. And that's really a reflection, I would say, of the nutrient profile. And then if you look at the literature, the absence of other harmful things in these foods. I want to come back to your diet as a whole at this point. And the way I remember it, last time we talked, you were doing a carnivore diet, you were big on organ meats, and you were big on eating nose to tail. And the way I understand it now, you've included honey, raw dairy, and a significant amount of fruit for carbohydrates. In each of those categories, there are beyond the meat, and, and you're still into organs too, but in each of those categories beyond the meat, the dairy the fruit, the honey. Talk about why you've chosen to include each of those. Like, is there specific nutrients in each of those realms? Going back to your story, as you shared it before, we know electrolytes was a problem you ran into as as a carnivore. But why the diversity? Is it for flavor? Is it for nutrients? Why why not just add, say, fruit back in and, and keep it more simple? Yeah, so we can talk about all of those things individually. It's a great question. Let's talk about raw dairy. We've talked a little bit about the fruit and the honey, but I'll talk about raw dairy. So I feared dairy. I was fearful of dairy for many years because I think that pasteurized dairy was a major allergen for me growing up. I grew up in Northern Virginia. My father was a physician. My mom was a nurse. So with my asthma and eczema, I was wildly over-medicated. And I think that pasteurized dairy was a problem for me. And it wasn't until the last few years that I understood why this could potentially be I came across a significant amount of literature. There's many, many studies showing benefits to unpasteurized dairy. There are multiple observational studies in children showing that kids who eat raw dairy, whether it's cheese, milk, butter, kefir, which is fermented milk, 
some people say kefir, on or off the farm have lower rates of asthma, eczema, allergies, hay fever when they're adults. That's fascinating. And it's observational, so correlation is not causation, but that's a pretty striking finding that shows up repeatedly in studies. And what we know about raw milk is that when you heat milk that comes out of a cow or a goat or a camel, whatever you want to milk, it changes the conformation of many of the proteins in that milk. And it changes the population of bacteria in the milk, many of which are commensal and probably valuable and impact the human gut in a positive way. Whey protein specifically is found to be very beneficial for humans, but especially beneficial and probably most beneficial when it's undenatured. Anything above 147 degrees or 150 degrees Fahrenheit seems to change the conformation of the whey protein. And it looks like many of these immunologic benefits are lost. So that's a pretty big deal. So I thought, okay, if this food can affect my immune system in a positive way, potentially affect my gut in a positive way, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and it's getting me a source of bioavailable calcium and more animal-based nutrients, K2, menaquinone, choline, et cetera, it's something I want to have in my diet. And for people that drink raw milk, you know, it's, it's delicious. And what I found was that when I reincorporated raw dairy first as Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese and then as raw milk, I, I wasn't nearly as lactose intolerant as I expected to be. And I've later learned that most of these raw milks contain bacteria that can populate the human gut and then produce this lactase enzyme, even if you've lost it. It seems that the A1 casein protein, which is another protein in milk, is only really allergenic for humans when it's pasteurized. Again, this conformational changes in the proteins of milk that happen a lot with cooking. So when I incorporated raw milk, I didn't have any recurrence of eczema. I felt better. And I was aware that I was getting like all these interesting nutrients. And I think my gut felt even better than it did before. Subjectively, and this is just my experience, I felt like when I was surfing, I could surf longer. I just, I don't know how to describe it. It was like I had, I had more drive to surf. I was more driven to surf for longer amounts of time. I didn't, and it wasn't that I was running out of gas, but I think that well, before, I, this is just my subjective experience, take from it what you will. I would go out in the ocean, I would surf two, two and a half hours, sometimes three hours. Whereas before I would just kind of, after an hour and a half, I would just think, ah, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm kind of tired. But it, it just changed, my subjective experience would have changed something for me. And again, my gut felt better. I think my poop got better when I started adding raw milk. The more I've learned about raw milk, the more people I've talked to, I recently went to a farm in California called Raw Farm, the biggest raw dairy in the world. And the stories I heard from them, that people have told them, what I heard in Los Angeles when I was there at Erewhon doing the smoothie launch, the first animal-based smoothie at Erewhon. So many people came up to me and talked about how raw milk had improved their gut and fixed their gut. And this is so interesting because in the space that I'm in as a physician, people who have gut issues, that's been the hardest thing to fix for them. We as humans are just bombarded our whole life with things that are bad for our gut flora. There's this trillions of bacteria in our gut, this whole another alien organism that lives between your mouth and your anus, really. Trillions of bacteria, 10 to the 16th bacteria, more cells than you have in your human body by a factor of three or four, who knows. And we're just changing the composition of that collective organism with antibiotics, with pesticides, probably with lectins, defense chemicals and plants. So then this interesting question is how the heck do you rehabilitate that? And probiotics make sense, but in my experience, they don't always work. Sometimes they make it worse. But raw milk, of, of all the things that I've seen clinically, raw milk is hands down the best for people's guts. And whether it's raw milk or raw kefir, fermented milk, those two things are incredibly valuable for human guts in terms of reestablishing healthy populations in the gut. And that just makes so much sense to me intuitively. And I don't know if there's any published literature. We need to do some, but there are studies on raw milk and kids with respiratory tract infections. There's studies on the immunologic differences between raw and pasteurized milk for mothers. Like I said, there's studies in kids with less allergy, asthma, and eczema. So there's a ton of literature that raw milk is beneficial for humans and affects our immune system. I've never seen anything about the gut flora, but you can imagine that 
Raw milk is basically a probiotic food. It is the original probiotic food. And when you or I were hopefully breastfeeding as children, the first thing that we had was this milk from our mothers with thousands of different types of organisms. Raw, I mean, breast milk is not sterile, just like raw cow's milk is not sterile. It's just that those skin flora are what our bodies expect. Even if it's from a mammal other than your mom, it seems to be very beneficial for the human gut in a lot of different ways. So that's really interesting that you can, in some ways for people that have, this may sound a little controversial, but I think it's, it makes the point for people that have issues with their gut that have potentially negatively changed the populations in their gut. In some ways you can return to breastfeeding by getting raw, good quality mammalian milk into your diet. And that's really cool. All right. There's a few nuances I want to get into within the milk realm here. You've stated your obvious preference for raw versus pasteurized. Do you ever have pasteurized milk, though, just more as a calorie source, as something more as a neutral food? And say, like, you're out to eat and there's less choices, will you have it then? Or would you ever bring it in the house? I'm just curious how stern you are on only having raw. I'm intense about it. I don't do anything with pasteurized. In fact, I was recently in Greece with a friend and we were on his boat and they said that we were drinking raw milk, but we weren't drinking raw milk. And that was really the the main change. Um, now, again, I'm in Greece, so I'm eating different foods, but I'm basically eating meat and fruit and honey. And I could tell that my body was reacting differently to that, that pasteurized milk. And again, it's just my anecdote, but I was getting like a little acne and it's funny, I would get acne like on my collarbone. I would get acne like here on my shoulder. I never get this, right? A little bit on my neck. Like it's just, it seems to be like an autoimmune type of reaction. I got these multiple sort of like pimples on my collarbone, along my collarbone. And I think that was related just observationally to this, this pasteurized milk. So I've just learned that my immune system doesn't like pasteurized milk and I would rather not drink milk than, than have something that's pasteurized. I don't think it works for me. Got it. So it has to be raw. And through you sharing your dairy story there, we know you're into cow milk. What about other animals such as sheep and goat? Oftentimes in the health and wellness space, people that don't do cow for whatever reason will include these other animal milks. And there's been talk that they're, you know, easier on the body for people that have trouble with cow milk. So how do you feel, say you're at Whole Foods and, and you're picking up some raw cheese and you have an option of sheep, uh, goat, or cow, will you grab all three to have diversity or do you gravitate more to one? I like them all, but I really like goat milk. I drink a lot of goat milk here in Costa Rica. I would definitely drink sheep's milk. I don't have any problem with other species' milks if they're mammals. I've had camel milk before. I've heard there's horse milk. I would like to try horse milk. I think I would try any mammal's milk if it's raw. I think it's fine. And when I'm at Whole Foods, usually if I can find a raw sheep's milk cheese, I like that. Or a raw goat cheese, I tend to prefer those, but I don't think there's anything really different. People get kind of hung up on the A1 versus A2, and I think that's not as much of an issue if it's unpasteurized. The tricky part about Whole Foods is that Whole Foods doesn't do raw milk because they did have an experience where some of their customers got sick from a poorly produced raw milk farm many years ago. Thankfully, Sprouts does raw milk, especially in California, other stores. And Sprouts actually has some raw kefir from this raw farm throughout the country, if you can find that as well. How do you feel about colostrum from a cow? This is a popular supplement that can be found. I believe Heart and Soil even has colostrum in one of the products at least. Yeah. Is this something you, you include in your diet on a regular basis? When I can get it, yeah, yeah. I think that the colostrum, so the grass-fed colostrum from Heart and Soil is one of the most common supplements that I take because it's hard to get fresh colostrum. I can often get fresh liver or fresh heart. In Costa Rica, it's not too hard to find fresh testicles. Heart and Soil makes desiccated organs, so if, you, if I can't find those or someone can't find those organs, you can get the capsules, which are freeze-dried. But even here in Costa Rica, it's very hard for me to find fresh colostrum, so the freeze-dried colostrum is pretty good. And I think that colostrum is incredibly valuable for humans. I mean, the, there's probably 250 studies on colostrum in the medical literature. There's a peptide in colostrum called colostronin, studied again for childhood respiratory tract infections. 
Colostrum has been studied in Alzheimer's disease models. It's been studied in humans for cognitive decline. I mean, it's, it's a pretty powerful food. Colostrum is the first milk from mammals and it's quote milk. It's mostly immunoglobulins. So it's a very highly immunologically, I would say active substance and it's valuable. It's really cool. I am, I'm glad that people are beginning to use it and appreciate it because I think that just like raw milk, it's, it's kind of like a concentrated form of raw milk. All right. So we have the colostrum. I know you're big on to obviously your, your company heart and soil. Again, you're big into organs in supplement form or having them as whole foods. Any other supplements that you've included since we last None. talked? None. Salt. And I'm intentional about the salt. And I try to find salt that's low in microplastics. There's a couple of different salts. There's a Kalima salt. There's a couple of other different salts that can say they're low in microplastics. So microplastics are just getting into all of our food supplies and I'm just intentional about that. But I haven't really felt the need and it's been a very interesting, I think, endeavor to think about what supplements I would possibly include. A lot of people include magnesium. And so I did chronometer for my diet on my podcast, which is now called the Paul Saladino MD podcast. And I'm getting like 125% of the RDA for magnesium in my diet from milk, from orange juice, from coconut water, and meat is actually a really good source of magnesium. In terms of minerals, if you're eating liver and you're eating red meat, I can't think of a mineral that you're gonna be deficient in. I mean, you're gonna get manganese. I think people sometimes get wrapped around the axle with thymine, but there's plenty of thymine in, in different fruits. There's plenty of thymine in organs and animal foods. So in terms of B vitamins, if you're including liver, you've got riboflavin, you've got choline, you've got biotin, things that are not as rich in muscle meat. In fact, riboflavin and biotin are particularly poor in muscle meat, so adding organs helps with that. You're getting plenty of B6, B5, B12. Folate is also in liver and egg yolks. So in terms of the B vitamins, you're pretty well covered. In terms of the minerals, you're pretty well covered. In terms of the other vitamins, the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin E is really prevalent in animal fat, butter. Vitamin C is in fruit, orange juice. I'll have some fresh squeezed orange juice every day. And then the carbohydrates help with the other mineral retention so that I don't have to do a whole lot of these electrolytes anymore. I don't supplement potassium. It actually can be dangerous to supplement potassium depending on your kidney status. So I think that a salt, basically a sodium, allows your body to hold on to all of the other minerals and you look at this animal-based diet, which is basically what I've called this meat, organs, fruit, honey, raw, dairy. There's really nothing, nothing missing. And I'm just not saying that. That's what I see on chronometers. So I don't feel the need to supplement with anything else. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in, in what kind of things people feel like they need or benefit from. But I think as long as I can get the organs and I'm getting the fresh organs or the desiccated organs, like hard and soil, I don't see a need to do much of anything here. Well, one of the things I think is really unique about your diet versus, say, some of the carnivores or other people eating an animal-based diet is the amount of organs that you consume, or at least presumably from following your work online. A lot of people these days, whether they're, you know, variety of different diets, people are including them for the different health benefits and the amount of nutrients they contain. But it seems like for you, you're consuming them in whole food form and in supplement form, you're the founder of a company that, you know, does organ supplements. So that makes sense. You're going to be having a lot of them compared to the average Joe. But what I'm getting at is how many organs do we need? And the reason I ask that is I'm picturing somebody back in the day, ancestral times, killing an animal, harvesting the organs. They're going to have a lot of muscle meat. They're going to have a relatively small amount of organs. So again, in your diet, it seems like you're having quite a few of these. Do you feel like you're doing more than our ancestors would do? Do you feel that's just an advantage of the 21st century and having access to them and you're better off because of it? I'm just curious on how you think of that from an ancestral perspective. Yeah. So um, I think that when I was doing a strict carnivore diet, perhaps because I was only eating meat and organs, I was eating more organs than I am now and a different variety. But right now on a daily basis, I have about half an ounce of liver, maybe an ounce of liver per day. So not a, not a huge amount, maybe the size of a quarter. 
per liver. And I'll do like frozen raw usually or desiccated like hardened soil. I'll do a few ounces of heart every day because I can just throw it on the grill with my meat. Heart is interesting. It's a muscle, but it is uniquely high in things like answerine, taurine, coenzyme Q10, some other peptides that are found in heart. So my go-tos on a daily basis are liver and heart. And I think if people are getting liver especially, that's a huge upgrade. If you add a little bit of heart every once in a while or a couple times a week, you're doing great. I might add in some testicle a few times a month just because we know the testicle contains bioactive androgens. I mean, I don't know if you've heard this story, but all of our supplements at Heart and Soil now are informed sports approved, which is like the NSF. It's actually more rigorous than NSF. So they have no contaminants, quote unquote, um, so that professional athletes can take them. So all the supplements are informed sports, except one. Only one of them failed. And that was our whole package supplement, which is the one with testicle. And it didn't fail because we add anything to it. It failed because testicle in the supplement naturally contains bioactive androgens, androstenedione, testosterone. So informed sports won't certify that one because it contains androgens. So we know the testicle contains androgens. And so, you know, I'm a man. My testosterone is great. My libido is good, especially when I sleep well. I've shown this in my blood work all the time. But I think testicle is valuable for men to eat, maybe even women sometimes too. But definitely as a man, I like to eat testicle every once in a while. And that's about the extent of my organs these days. If I come across, sometimes I get some tripe or some intestines. I'll cook some like intestines on the grill and those can be really good. But I don't do a lot of different things anymore. I think that the desiccated organs help with that. You know, beef organs is hard liver, kidney, spleen, and pancreas. That's easier for me than cooking kidney and pancreas and spleen, which are not super great. I haven't figured out a way to make those easily. So I don't eat a ton of organs anymore, but I think that the organs that I eat are like the most impactful ones that I can get easily. And that's what I want people to know that even if you just include liver, it's going to be a big deal. And people, it's, it's incredible what you hear from people who include things like testicle or other organs in their life too. All right. Let's talk about processing when it comes to organ meats. So you mentioned a few different things there, frozen liver, you mentioned cooking some organs. We know the supplements are desiccated, which is freeze dried, right? Is that a synonymous? I think it's a little different, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about, talk about supplements then and the different ways of processing and then talk about why someone would want to have certain organs prepared in certain ways and what we lose when they're cooked or freeze dried. Yeah. So the interesting thing about this conversation is that when I was with the Hadza, they didn't eat anything raw. They cooked it all. So we were eating cooked liver. They were not eating raw liver, but some African tribes will eat raw liver. And I'll tell you that when we hunted and, and killed animals with the Hadza and they took the liver out of the animal. They treated that thing like gold. It was like placed on a rock, very carefully cooked and then divided with the tribe. It probably makes sense being in the bush. Parasites are a thing. So I think there's value to cooked liver. Um, I have found that raw liver is easier for me to eat. I can either chew it and I think it's fairly safe because I believe that I'm getting it from a good source. I've never gotten sick from raw liver, but people should know that raw meat, raw organs, raw vegetables, all of these have risks. Raw milk, very safe, but I think that the most number of food poisoning cases actually come from raw vegetables now, um, and that pasteurized milk has just as many problems with contamination as raw milk does today. And if you get raw milk from a place like Raw Farm, they tested a whole bunch, that stuff is super, super safe. But if you wanna eat organs raw, that's great. I've eaten a lot of raw organs in my day. Raw heart, pretty freaking safe. If you've ever eaten a rare steak or, or a blue rare steak, you know that you can eat muscle meat pretty darn rare and raw and be just fine the vast majority of the time. But I do think that if you eat a whole bunch of ground beef raw, you're probably going to run into problems just because the meat is all ground together. So there are values to cooked organs. What's interesting for me about freeze drying organs is that you can basically take the water out of an organ at a temperature below what you find in the freezer of your house. That's what freeze drying is. There's something called the triple point where you can sublimate water. You can just take it directly from a solid to a gas if you make the pressure low enough. So that's what a freeze dryer does. It lowers the pressure and you can just take the water out of something at a very, very low temperature. So what's interesting about that is that you can make these desiccated organs, well, let's say freeze dried, it's probably the correct term, and it preserves as many of the nutrients as possible. There were studies done on raw organs and freeze-dried organs in the 1950s on animals. And they found that 
there were these bioactive factors, probably peptides, that were present in raw and present in freeze-dried organs that were not present in cooked organs. So that kind of stuff makes me think, oh, it's probably good to get some cooked organs, probably good to get some freeze-dried organs, maybe good to get some raw organs too. But I think that there is something to this like idea that if you cook your organs and you cook all of your food all the way through, you may be missing some benefits. I came across a nutrient recently that I was reminded of named taurine. And there's a lot of longevity arguments out there now against meat. People in the longevity space don't eat meat. Ironically, they also take about 100 supplements, many of which are nutrients found exclusively in meat. Things like carnosine or taurine. And the data on taurine is very compelling. There was actually an article published in June or July of 2023 in Science talking about how across worms, across mice, and across primates, taurine supplementation extends lifespan. Well, taurine is only found in meat. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense that something found exclusively in meat would extend lifespan, but that meat would be bad for your lifespan. And I did a podcast recently about that. There's a number of nutrients like that. Anserine, creatine, carnosine, B12, 4-hydroxyproline, which is a component of collagen. All of these are found exclusively or vastly predominantly in meat and connective tissue, and they're very good for humans. So it just kind of flies in the face of these anti-longevity meat arguments. But the point of this point, the point of this discussion here was that taurine is actually denatured 40 to 50% when you cook meat. So there's probably benefit to eating a medium rare or a rare steak. You can sear the outside, get rid of anything problematic on the outside of the steak, but then you're getting some rare-ish meat in the middle. And even though I talked about the dangers of ground beef, I eat most of my hamburgers medium, medium rare. And I think that the same goes with liver. You know, when you're eating raw liver, you're getting more taurine, you're getting all of the bioactive factors. So that's kind of the spectrum and why you'd want to do one thing or another. The safest thing is a freeze-dried organ or a cooked organ. And I think that the, the most risky thing is a raw organ. In the middle is probably liver that's cooked on the outside and pink in the middle, just like a steak. But again, I, I definitely roll the dice and haven't had any issues with fully raw liver. I think freezing it probably helps somewhat. But people don't have to feel like that's something they have to do if that's not doable for them. Got it. Let's come back to the honey piece of the diet. I'm curious, because you've added in fruit and honey... Is there anything specific in the honey that you're getting nutrient-wise that you wouldn't get from the fruit? Or is that just to add more diversity? It's more diversity. Um, I like the way honey tastes in raw milk. And I'm pretty active. So this morning I surfed for two hours in the ocean, and then I'll get a workout, maybe skate this afternoon. And in interesting, humbling fashion, I've found that Basically, the more carbohydrates I eat, the better I feel now. The more carbohydrates I eat, the better I recover, the stronger I am, the better my libido is, the better I sleep. So I don't fear carbohydrates at all. And oftentimes I'll eat 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. And I'm five, nine and a half, 170 pounds. So I'm not a huge human, but I am quite active and I'll get 300, 300 plus grams. And the easiest way for me to do that is with honey in addition to fruit. I mean, I can get orange juice in the morning. I can squeeze some orange juice. I can have local tropical fruit. Right now we've got rambutan in season and some mangosteen, which people may, may or may not be familiar with. There's some mangoes, there's pineapple, but getting 300 grams of carbohydrates from fruit would take a lot of work. And fruit juice makes it easier. Sometimes when I talk about fruit juice, people say that's not evolutionarily appropriate. And I think, well, I'm pretty sure our ancestors would juice fruit. <laughs> they don't like fiber that much. When I was with the Hadza, they would often chew roots and spit out all the fiber. So I think it's common for humans to, to sort of make juice in their mouth by spitting out extra fiber in fibrous fruits. And if they had the ability, I think that it's, it's common to see them make juice. I mean, many indigenous cultures make sugarcane juice, which is quite delicious and probably very healthy for humans without being processed. Juicing is, is very common. Uh, more common than people think. So I could make a lot of juice out of the fruit, but the honey is another thing that's beneficial, I think, in terms of the carbohydrates. There's actually also studies in diabetics showing that honey improves insulin sensitivity. So I think that 
coming back to this idea that, and this may sound ironic to people, I hope to share ideas that are valuable for people. And the intention has always been to suggest the highest degree of variety with the least amount of toxins. And that's expanding over time, right? In the carnivore diet, there's not a lot of variety, but I think that I was thinking incorrectly about the toxins that could be in fruit. I was worried about the sugars there. So now I think, why not have honey in your diet? It actually has a lot of good data in diabetics, cardiovascular disease, in addition to fruit and fruit juice, which have similar data. There's data with red, blood red orange juice, regular orange juice, and a few other fruit juices, I think grape juice, showing improvements in endothelial function, sort of post, post-contraction dilatation in the endothelium, which is the blood vessel lining on the inside of both the, the veins and the arteries. So when people say that fruit is bad for humans or it causes insulin resistance, I sort of shake my head and, and wait for them to show me any sort of data that really corroborates that and doesn't really work that way. There's data showing that fructose is harmful in animal models, but fructose is not the same as fruit in a whole food form. And animal models are uniquely bad at predicting fructose in humans because mice and rats metabolize fructose very differently than humans. People also conflate studies with high fructose corn syrup and things with honey and fruit. So those don't look the same in human data either. There's actually data in mice, interestingly, showing that when <clears throat> mice are fed sucrose, so table sugar, which is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose, versus high fructose corn syrup, which is theoretically also glucose and fructose, at pretty similar ratios, the mice gain much more weight on the high fructose corn syrup. So you have one you know, component, which is probably moderately processed in sucrose and one component, which is highly processed in high fructose corn syrup, and you're not looking at really the same thing. So that's a bit of a digression about fruit and sugar fear, but hopefully I answered your question there. You talked about something there I want to highlight. I think it's really important. The fact that as we're hearing about your diet and how it's evolved and how you have quite a few carbohydrates now, it's important to note the fact that you are highly active. And you, again, you did touch on this, but you some are somebody who is out surfing and you talked about skateboarding. Like I'm only judging this from what I see online, but you're moving your body, you know, throughout the whole day, more than the average person by far. So for somebody who's taking this in right now, and maybe they're working an office job and they're like, oh, I can have carbs again and honey. And it's like, you need to really take that in context of, the lifestyle you're living, which is very unique. And at the website, which is paulsaladinomd.co.co, there's a free animal-based calculator. And we kind of put a metric in there for how active are you? And you can go and say, oh, I'm very active or moderately active or just minimally active. And the calculator will scale the carbohydrates for you. So I think that definitely not everyone needs 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. Most people probably don't need 200 grams of carbohydrates a day. But for some people who are elite athletes or who are active, getting more carbohydrates clearly has profound benefits. And oftentimes when people go from carnivore to animal-based, they won't eat enough carbohydrates and that causes problems. So if anything, people tend to err on the side of too few carbohydrates actually. Um, and that causes issues. I hear people all the time. I mean, we're doing this month at Hardened Soil, we're doing the Animal Based 30, which is a free 30 day animal based eating challenge. And people will often say, I do jujitsu and I'm getting muscle cramps. And I say, or the team will say, What are you eating? And they say, Well, I'm having like four ounces of strawberries and a handful of blueberries a day. And we say, Well, that's great. That's like 35 grams of carbohydrate. <laughs> that's nothing. So, getting someone at least above 100, if they're even moderately active in terms of carbohydrates, makes a massive difference. And I think some people have talked about doing an animal-based diet and they just don't. It's easier for people to get carbohydrates from oatmeal or sweet potatoes. And sweet potatoes are kind of this gray area, but oatmeal is something I'm not a huge fan of at all. It's easier for people to get carbohydrates from oatmeal than it is from fruit and honey. They just don't eat enough fruit. They don't eat enough fruit juice. We have this fear of these things and most people tend to be too low carb and they end up just going low carb and they're keto again and they end up with all the same problems. 
And another area that highlights the point I was making there of your unique lifestyle, when you talked about supplements, you didn't mention vitamin D, which is a common one for a lot of people here in North America. You're now down in Costa Rica where you're getting sun and you're out with your shirt off. And I'm here in Ontario where we have, you know, gray skies for the majority, not the majority, you know, maybe two thirds of the year. So depending on your unique situation, you have to look at this with unique eyes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that the video is showing it really well right now, but I'm pretty tan. You look good, Jesse. You look like you're tan from here. I don't know. Well, you're catching me in that one third of the year where we have sun. So I'm getting sun right now and I'm taking full advantage of that. But in the other two thirds of the year, I'm making sure my vitamin D supplementation is in a good range. And again, it's just, you're living this really unique life. And I just want to make sure that point is highlighted. I think vitamin D is a, is a valuable supplement for people. And you're right. I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, I do think that it is it's, it's interesting living near the equator. So I live at the eighth, I live at a latitude of eight, eight north latitude. Austin, Texas, I think is 27, 28. In Ontario, you're probably 39. Who knows? Um, maybe 36, maybe 36, 34. I think Seattle was pretty far up there. Um, and so I think that the cutoff is something like 27, 28. If you're above 27, 28 in the latitude, and you can just look this up online, there is a significant portion of the year where you have a vitamin D winter where the sun never actually gets high enough in the sky to make any vitamin D. Even if it's a sunny day, it's valuable to be in the sun for your circadian rhythm, but you're not making any vitamin D on your skin. So you, you have to really do something else to, to get that, that nutrient. And for most of us, Probably the ideal would be getting super tan in the summer, but even in the summer, you probably can't go out and get massively tan in Ontario because you need to do some work inside at some point. I mean, you're podcasting from indoors right now. You're losing your tan. Exactly. Bro. There you we go. Are. Well, let's talk more about that move. So obviously with this lifestyle you're living, you know, you love surfing. You're a very active guy. Costa Rica makes sense from that perspective. Now you're incorporating fruit. I'm assuming there's a lot of good fruit down there. But talk about when you made the move and what the reasons were behind that, if there's anything beyond what I just said. Yeah, so I moved to Costa Rica about two and a half years ago. I first lived on the Guanacaste Peninsula in a town called Santa Teresa. I've since moved away from there, and now I live on the coast elsewhere. But I was living in Austin, Texas, and I was missing, this is gonna sound strange to people, I was missing flow state. So I started skiing in my early 20s. When I was 21 or 22, I threw hiked to the Pacific Crest Trail, which means I walked from Mexico to Canada. And after that trip with my friend that I hiked with, I moved to Telluride and I started skiing in Southwest Colorado and I never had skied before in my life. And I thought, this is really cool. It just kind of unlocked something for me that I'd never had before, which is this flow state, this idea that moving across snow, preferably powder snow, was did interesting things to my brain. It just tickled my brain in unique ways and it brought incredible amounts of joy to my life. And so for the next six years, I basically chased flow state, downhill mountain biking, mountain biking, skiing, climbing, mountaineering, and um, eventually I went back to graduate school to physician assistant school where I worked as a cardiology PA for four years before returning to medical school. And that was the beginning of my medical journey. But so I had like six years of this very unique time in my life where I was just doing something where in the moment in flow state, you just sort of lose yourself. It's just, it's so fun. It's just, for lack of a better word, is is just pure joy as a child and you're just, you're so in the moment because you have to just focus on what you're doing. Fast forward to two and a half years ago, I was in Austin. I love the people there, but I was just missing this flow state. I had a foil board that I would take out to Lake Travis, but it wasn't quite the same. I'd started surfing a few years before that in Seattle when I was in my residency, which is about the worst place to ever learn to surf. But even though I'd probably only been on handful of legitimate waves in my whole life after leaving Seattle and moving to Austin. I, that feeling was just 
really meaningful to me. And this may sound, I don't know how it, what word I want to use there. It may sound trivial to people, but I've come to realize that in my own life, the more fun I'm having and the more joy that I experience on a daily basis, the more productive I am in my work. So the more of my passions, my real passions, not my work passions, but my just hobbies, my quote unquote frivolous passions that I pursue, the more productive I am in my creative work in the world. So I think that getting to surf, getting to skateboard, getting to do these things over the last five years has been a key component of all the work that I've done in the world, writing a book, building companies, podcasting, like this is what keeps me going. And it, it's really the antidote to burnout for me. So in Austin, I was feeling kind of burned out. I just didn't have enough flow state. I couldn't get this. And maybe I could have found a boat or rented a boat or found friends with a boat and gone wake surfing. But I was on my way back from Tanzania, visiting the Hadza, and I came to Costa Rica on a vacation and ended up just staying. So it was an eight day vacation. I got to surf in Santa Teresa. I loved it. I got to see the sunrise. I think I got to experience firsthand a lot of the things that you were describing that I didn't even know that I was missing in Austin. I was up with the sun. I was grounding in the ocean. My circadian rhythm was programmed because I was getting the sunlight in my eyes. I was watching sunsets, it was community. I was in the ocean surfing, flow state, and just so everyone knows, I'm a pretty mediocre surfer, but I really love it. I'm not great, but I still, I'm getting better, but I really like it. And so it was just this, the realization like, wow, this is the best life I've ever lived. I want to keep doing this. And so I did. So I just, you know, eight days turned into two months, turned into three months, turned into a year. And now I live in Costa Rica. Yeah. And thankfully I can do my work virtually. So I don't have to be somewhere in the United States. Did anybody else move down with you or was this a solo thing? Solo, bro. It's charging. Yeah. And that's that's why I brought this up because we know community is such an important piece for, it sounds like you're in a really good mental place and you're getting these this flow benefit. And I'm assuming there's a great community there, but how how is that part of your life panned out since, you know, pulling yourself out of Austin and plopping yourself in this new area have you been able to quickly make a new community and group of friends there? Not quickly, but it's happening. I think surfing helps because there's so much camaraderie in surfing. You're out there in the ocean, especially when the waves get overhead or moderately large. You're just out there with friends and you're watching each other get destroyed by waves or you're watching each other get a great wave and you're cheering each other on and you meet people on the beach, watching the surf. It's just a very tight knit community of people. And the, my community now expands out from there. And everywhere I've gone in Costa Rica, it's really started with the surfing community, meeting people on the beach and in the ocean. One of the nice things about living on the coast is that you see people on the beach and you see people you know. There's also farmer's markets here. So I see people at farmer's markets. So there's just this different pace of life and there's an ease of intersection of our lives, right? I live in a small town and so there's people that I know and I'm very likely to bump into those people in certain places. So it's this ease of community. People know people and I think when you're living in Costa Rica, especially as an expat, so someone from the United States, you've made this intentional choice when you find other people, whether it's families or single people, you think, why are you here? What are you doing here? Everyone has an interesting story they want to live a different life. They want to live in the jungle. They want clean air, clean water, proximity to surfing, whatever. It lends itself to just very human connections and commonalities, which is pretty cool. So it doesn't feel as separated, right? Like we're just not as separate from other people here. We wear less clothes. We're mostly barefoot. I'm shirtless. This is very rare that I'm even wearing a shirt for this podcast. You see people all over the place. So it's, it's, it feels more like being a human to me in a lot of ways. And I think that if people are listening to this and thinking, that's great for you, Paul, but I could never do that. All I would say is there's lessons in all of that that can be employed wherever you are. You can get sun in the morning, wherever you live. You can get into the sun in the summer. You can go to bodies of water. You can ground, you can touch grass. And I think that if I were to move back to the United States and live anywhere in the United States or Canada, I'm not a Canadian citizen, but, or anywhere, 
I think that I would try to seek out some of the same things that I've created here for myself. Places where I'm going to connect with people who are like-minded kind of easily, whether that's a skate park or a Whole Foods or you know, some sort of community center where I'm going to intersect with people, that's very meaningful for me. It happens organically here, but I know in, in Austin now, there's a couple of places popping up where people who are like-minded end up hanging out with sauna and cold plunge and, or gyms. I think if you can find a gym where people are sort of like-minded, there are some gyms with a certain ethos that's different than other gyms, right? So that kind of stuff. I think you can create these things wherever you are. Um, I'm quite grateful to be able to do it here in Costa Rica, but I think it's scalable to most places. And I think wherever I would live now, I would want to be by water because being here has really reminded me of the benefits of that. Austin had some water. And when I used to live there, I would be at Barton Springs all the time. When I go back to visit, you can find me at Barton Springs. So if you guys are listening to this and if you go to Barton Springs, you'll probably see me there when I'm in Austin. I see people there all the time. Well, hearing your story here, you've at least alluded to the fact that it's crossed your mind that you might move back to the U.S. or move away from Costa Rica. How likely do you feel it'll be that you'll be in Costa Rica long term? Pretty likely. Any downsides of moving there? Sure. Um, in Costa Rica, there's this saying, Pura Vida, and we heard a joke, there's these Pura Vida problems. So most adulting, quote unquote, things are two to three times harder to do here. It's harder to pay your electric bill. It's harder to pay your internet bill. It's hard to get your car inspected. Cars break down here. Um, so there's definitely downsides, but for me, it's totally worth it. And once you figure out how to do it all, it, it's pretty doable. I live kind of up in the mountains, a few kilometers from the ocean. So power goes out sometimes internet goes out sometimes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I think landslides happen. A lot of roads are dirt. Um, things happen. Things happen. It's different. It's definitely different. It's not all roses here for sure, but it's, it's a different type of life. I think that I've gotten to a place now where I've been able to create a space that's a little bit more insulated from those things. I have backup batteries in my house and a generator and I haven't figured out the Wi-Fi yet. When I get Starlink, that'll be great. Um, if you find people in the community, you can lean on them to teach you where a good mechanic is and how to do the things you need to do for your car or how to pay your internet bill and your other things. There's like a whole, there's a whole industry that's sprung up around people helping other people move to Costa Rica and Central America because it's sort of heady. And believe me, when I first, when I first moved to Santa Teresa, my power and internet got shut off so I bought a house in Santa Teresa and now sold it. But I think within a month and a half of moving into that house, my power and internet got shut off because I thought, I don't even know how to pay this. And it's now, it's I just woke up one day, I don't have internet, I don't have power. What the heck? What do I, I don't even know how to do this. So it's, you can't just do it online. It's very difficult. Well, Paul, throughout our conversation, we've gotten a pretty good idea of the amount of activity you do, the different activities you do throughout the day, what work looks like, what your diet looks like. But I think it'd be interesting to take us through a typical day. When you get up, what you do, what you eat, what your eating window looks like. Can you take me through what that is? Yeah, it's evolved over time, but I go to sleep at about 8 p.m., which sounds really early until you realize that the sun goes down here at 6 p.m. year round because we're at the equator. So the days never really vary much, slightly, but not much. Sun comes up at about 5.15, so I usually get up with the sunrise. And I'm usually in the ocean before 6 a.m. surfing. Before I surf, I have a glass of raw milk and honey, maybe a coconut for water, like a real coconut. Surf for a couple hours, come back, eat breakfast. Breakfast is usually fresh squeezed orange juice, local fruit, grass-fed meat, steak or burger, cheese, raw milk, maybe some liver. And then uh, depending what time of the morning it is, I settle in, do a little stretching after surfing, sit down to do some work for a few hours. I try to block my work into like two deep work sessions of two or three hours. Usually I get like two, two hour blocks a day of deep work, creative work, whether it's 
podcasting with you or someone else, a podcast for my podcast, research for a podcast. After the first um, deep work session, I'll usually eat again, maybe a smaller meal, a little bit of meat, cheese, fruit, coconut type of thing. And then maybe another deep work session, maybe not, maybe an afternoon workout. My friend Ben Patrick was just here, knees over toes guy. So I do a lot of his stuff for workouts, not a whole lot of weightlifting, but it's a lot of mobility training. I sit too much, so I'm always trying to unlock my hips. I'm interested in the strength of my posterior deltoids, trying to make my posterior shoulders really strong for surfing, my tibialis muscles, my calves, these kind of things. I have a gym at my house, but I mostly end up doing body weight mobility stuff. In the afternoon, I'll often either go out for another surf or skate with my friends, maybe put up a slack line somewhere and then come home five, 5.30 dinner. I usually eat dinner by the time it gets dark here around six. Dinner is usually more grass-fed meat, raw dairy, honey, fruit, organs. And uh, I mean, I try and mix it up, but I'm one of these people that finds routine comforting. I don't really need to change my food if I've got good ground beef and I've got good fruit. I'll just eat that consistently. I don't have to eat crazy steaks or lots of different things. I don't use many spices on my food. In fact, I don't use any spices other than just a low microplastic sea salt. So yeah, the variety in my diet comes with like seasonal fruit here. Whatever's in season, I'll eat that. Like now, like I said, rambutan, mangosteen, pineapple, mango. It's coming into season. So yeah, it's meat, it's organs, it's fruit, fruit juice, raw dairy, honey. That's kind of what I eat. And I eat it throughout the day. So the eating window is pretty, it's pretty much the whole day. I used to intermittent fast. I don't do that anymore. I'll eat when I get up at six, you know, 5.30 in the morning. Eat my last meal at six, 6.30 sometimes. So yeah, it could be a 12 hour eating window or more in the day. And I think that that's fine. I don't really worry about that anymore. That's a whole separate conversation. Well, hearing you talk about what you eat and and the meat you're eating, it sounds like at least the majority of it is beef. I'm curious the diversity within that meat category. How much of it is beef? How much of it is ground beef? This ties back to what we talked about before. You know, you're a big fan of getting quality animal products. Are you having chicken, pork? And obviously it's going to be dependent on where you're living and what you have access to. So talk about the meat piece and what the diversity looks like. I haven't found any good chicken or pork in Costa Rica. So I just eat beef. There's a great butcher here in town that is grass fed, grass finished, uses no pesticides on their land. I was just talking to a friend about getting one of his cattle, a year and a half old um, cow that's been on their land, fed only grass, no pesticides the whole life. So probably will eat that meat. Um, most of what I eat is ground beef. I don't, I really like ground beef and I think it's affordable and it's not, yeah, you don't have to do anything crazy. When I do steak, I like skirt steak or flat iron or hanger steak. If I can get a good ribeye, I'll eat it, but that's not the majority of my meals. Um, I don't eat a lot of eggs, though I think eggs are great for humans because I just haven't found the right people to do it. On my land, I want to start growing chickens and maybe the chickens, I'll eat the chickens eventually and maybe I'll eat their eggs if I can just keep them safe from predators, we'll see, and just get them to eat bugs and crickets and worms and things like that. That would be an interesting piece of content to show what their eggs look like. So I don't eat much fish. I think that fish in general is problematic for humans in 2023 because of the heavy metals, the microplastics, PFAs, so perfluoroalkyl substances, the same kind of things that are in these Lululemon leggings are also in your fish. Endocrine disruptors, forever chemicals, or synonyms for that class of chemicals. I don't think it's a big deal if people want to eat fish every once in a while, but if you make fish the majority of your diet, I think it would be prudent to check your heavy metals because fish is a real problem when it comes to that stuff. It's just not not great for humans. and It's just polluted. So I don't eat, don't eat a lot of fish anymore, but I think it's reasonable on an animal-based diet. Same with chicken and pork. I just haven't found a good enough source and I found pretty good sources of beef. Um, yeah, and I get raw milk locally and farmers markets, again, community, talking to the farmers, organic produce there is great. 
You mentioned ground beef being a big part of the diet. How do you keep that interesting? How do you cook that? Man, I, you know, I, I think that if the ground beef has enough fat, you won't get bored of it. But if the ground beef is too lean, your body will get bored of it. And I don't think I'm programmed as differently from other people as those listening may believe. Um, for many people, when they think about eating a lot of meat, especially a lot of red meat, their first concern is I'm going to get so bored. But more often than not, <clears throat> I hear people surprised at how satisfying it is and how often they look forward to the next meal. As long as that meat has a reasonable amount of fat. So when I'm getting ground beef, I'm getting 80-20, at least 85-15, never 90-10. And if I need to make it more interesting, I'll just add some butter. I think meat gets boring when it's just protein. If you have some fat in there, it's juicy. It's just, it's rewarding and your body's going to love it. It's just people are eating meat that's too lean and it feels boring. So if you get fat in your meat, it's going to be fine most of the time. If you're really a foodie and you're using food as entertainment, that's great. Food is amazing. And oftentimes that, that can be an impediment to really optimizing your health. So I like ground beef because it's easy. It tastes good. One of the downsides living in Costa Rica is we don't have Angus cattle here or Wagyu. They don't do well in the heat. We have a mixture of Brahmin and Angus or I think it's Nel Yor cattle and they're not as good. So the ribeyes I've had here are very hit and miss. Every once in a while I get a good ribeye, but the skirt steak is fine, but the ground beef is just, hey, if you've got kind of tough meat, just make ground beef out of it. I'm a simple man. I'll make bone broth also. I forgot about that. I've actually got some oxtail in the crock pot, uh, instant pot right now that I'm going to use for collagen. So yeah, I don't think ground beef is problematic. If people want to do different steaks, that's fine. And if you need variety, chicken, pork, fish, fine, great. Just think about the pros and cons of each piece of that. And yeah, I would say the piece that people are probably not thinking about with regard to boredom is the fat content of the meat. People want to trim the fat off and that doesn't make exciting meat. So you mentioned even adding butter into the ground beef. Will you ever add other things like tallow or coconut oil? You could add tallow if you wanted to. Uh, I don't add coconut oil. I generally don't use coconut oil for anything anymore. Um, but you could. Sometimes you could put a little cheese. I think people will, will intuitively understand that like a cheeseburger is more interesting than a hamburger. That's probably because of, well, the dairy is interesting and the fat and the cheese is good too. So I suppose if you wanted to, you could put some cheese in your burger if it's too lean or something and then grill it. I also have a really nice grill here in Costa Rica that I brought from the United States. And so it makes the meat pretty good. I'm really honing in on this ground beef piece because I do tend to enjoy ground beef as well. And I'm trying to think of different ways I can diversify and, and enjoy it in a different realm. I love burgers, but do you find a lot of the time you're just like cooking it up in a pan and, and then putting it on a plate and eating it with a fork and keeping it really simple? Or is it mostly burgers? I just really want your ideas as somebody that really eats a lot of that. I cook it on a grill. I don't cook in the pan ever. So the grill I think helps. And, you know, um, I will eat it with, I usually have a glass of milk with it or I'll have a glass of orange juice with it, or I'll have some fruit with it, but I'm pretty simple. It's usually fruit and meat, some kind of orange juice, milk. And I think, I mean, how, how lean is your ground beef? To be honest, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I'm gonna, now that I know the percentages, I'm gonna be more keen on observing that and looking for the fattier, the fattier meat. And I think there's a lot of, I don't know how much regulation there is around saying something is 80-20 and then actually have, really having it be 80-20. The leaner, the leaner meats are actually usually more expensive. So I don't know why they would mislabel an 80-20, but um, a lot of times when I go to the US, I will get ground beef and it says it's 80-20 and I think this is not even, not even close. 80-20 is pretty fatty ground beef. You'll know it. And I've had ground beef in the United States that's even more fatty than that. It's probably 25 or 30% fat, and that's really good. 
So 70, 30. And if you're getting meat from a butcher and they can grind some extra fat in there for you, it'll be really good. I had this ground beef in the States. I think it was from Panorama Farms. And it had, I think it was 26 or 28 grams of fat per serving, which sounds like a lot if you think fat is bad for you. It sounds like a lot if you think fat is good for you, but it was delicious. Most ground beef per serving is 17 to 18 grams. And I think the serving sizes on the back of a ground beef package, I'd have to guess it's either four or six ounces. So I'm not sure exactly how much is in there, but you definitely want more fat in your ground beef. It'll taste so much better. And obviously I believe that animal fat is good for humans. Vitamin E, vitamin K2, so many other good fat soluble nutrients, stearic acid. So don't fear the animal fat, it just tastes better. A lot of fatty burgers then. Yeah, fatty burgers or adding cheese to your burger or raw cheese to your burger. You know what I've had also that's really good is raw cream. I know raw milk is illegal in Canada, unfortunately. Um, that's probably the number one reason you should move. But if you have raw cream and you add raw cream to your burger, that's, I don't know how you could get bored of that. You can also take an egg yolk if you have good eggs and you want to crack a raw egg yolk, not the white, but just a raw egg yolk on your burger. That makes it interesting too. I've done that. Um, raw cream cheese on a burger is great. So adding the fat onto the burger, different flavors, that's really good. Honey. So one of the best things is just butter and honey or sour cream and honey, yogurt and honey, yogurt and egg yolk, like all like the creamy fatty things on the burger, you're sot. Thank you for that. A lot of great ideas. Let's move into body care products. And I think this has a couple different layers to it. One being the fact you're in Costa Rica and you probably don't have access like you do in the US. And then two being the fact that your, your diet and your lifestyle is animal based. So how do you source good products to clean your skin? And, and we'll even bring that into the home too. Let's talk about the different products you're using on your body and in your home that you feel good about. Yeah, this is actually really interesting. So I hate fragrances. I hate fragrances. A lot of time fragrances are phthalates or other things that humans don't want. So I don't like fragrances in my laundry detergent. I don't like fragrances in my dishwasher detergent. I don't like, I don't even use a dishwasher. I wash my dishes by hand. So what I discovered in Costa Rica is that white vinegar is amazing laundry detergent. And that's all I get. It's $3 for a huge jug of white vinegar. And I just put that in my washing machine and my clothes are great. So if you look at laundry detergents in general, there's a compound found in a lot of laundry detergents called 1,4-dioxane. It's a probable, almost certain human carcinogen, and it's above two parts per million in, in many different laundry detergents. So even laundry detergents that are fragrance-free have 1,4-dioxane in them something you can absorb from your clothes. So I really like washing my clothes in vinegar. One of the hardest things for me about traveling is that I go to Airbnbs and the sheets are washed in some fragrance containing laundry detergent. So if you want to use a detergent, the seventh generation fragrance-free has 0,1,4-dioxane, but that's the only one I've seen that has 0,1,4-dioxane. I have no affiliation with them, but I just use vinegar for my clothes, works great. For my dishes, I run into the same problem in Costa Rica. In the United States, I can get seventh generation or Ecos, like fragrance-free dishwasher soap or hands, basically not hand soap, but soap for my brush because I just wash my dishes by hand. I like that process. I don't like dishwashers. But in Costa Rica, it's very hard to find those things. So I realized baking soda works great for that. So my two home care products are white vinegar and baking soda. And it's, it's so satisfying to think, oh, this is super cheap. Baking soda is like, there's nothing contaminating it. Super clean. It's usually USP, so US Pharmacopeia, you know, like it's sodium bicarbonate. That's it. Um, and it works great. So that's what I use for my dishes. I wash them by hand. If you look at dishwasher detergents, a lot of them contain alcohol ethoxylates, which are known to damage the human gut. And a lot of that residue stays on the dishes. So you probably could find a, a better dishwasher detergent, but when I, when I look on Amazon, dishwasher detergents are tough. Even the clean ones have alcohol ethoxylates in them. So dish soaps, you can probably get a good dish soap if you wash them by hand. But if you want to wash your dishes in a dishwasher, be careful. You're probably leaving residue on there. It's not great for you and your family. In terms of soaps, same kind of stuff. I would use a soap that's fragrance-free or had some essential oil in it that I like the scent of. I don't really use any scent 
that's made from tallow or something. Um, in Costa Rica, I don't use any soap. I just rinse off in water. I'm in the ocean hours a day. I have good water in my house. We actually, the, the water for this neighborhood is from a spring and a well. So I just rinse off in water. I don't use soap on my body. Um, if I'm needing deodorant, I can either use apple cider vinegar or rubbing alcohol. There are some good natural deodorants out there that have, that are tallow based. I'll probably build one of my own here pretty soon and bring it to market, but that's in the works. Um, so if people want that stuff, it's available, but I think there are natural ways to change human odor if you're in a space where smelling like a human isn't effective or isn't acceptable. Interestingly, when I was in Los Angeles recently for the Erewhon smoothie launch, that animal-based smoothie with Erewhon, one girl came up to me and she goes, hey, can I smell you? And I thought, oh my God, all right, we got this on video. I'm sure we'll put it out as content. Because she'd heard that I don't, I don't use deodorant, I don't use soap. And she totally smelled me. She's like, you smell good. And I was like, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't smell bad. Um, I think wearing natural clothing helps with that. So I wear wool shirts and cotton shorts. In the past, when I wore synthetic clothing, polyester clothing stinks way more than natural clothing. And I found that wool clothing doesn't really smell. So sometimes if I have a cotton shirt and I work out in a lot, it'll get a little stinky. But wool doesn't even smell. Wool like resists the smell. So even not wearing deodorant, my clothing doesn't smell. And I feel like it's not so much the humans that smell, it's our clothing that smells because that gets like the oils and the skin cells and the bacteria break that down. And usually it's not humans, unless you're eating a crappy diet that smell bad, it's just your clothing that gets like metabolized by bacteria. So wool clothing has been a real nice hack for me for that. I mean, this woman, I've never met her. She like leans over and smells me right away in public and she was like, oh, you smell fine. It's proof. Um, I don't use toothpaste. Uh, I think toothpaste is a scam. I think you can remove the, the, the calculus from your teeth just with a toothbrush and water. And I don't think that you need toothpaste to fortify your teeth, especially if you're eating fat soluble nutrients found in liver and egg yolks and meat. I don't whiten my teeth. I don't do any of those things. I just use a toothbrush and water to brush my teeth. There are some of these tooth powders now that have calcium hydroxyapatite in them. And that may be beneficial for tooth enamel, but I think you have to be careful that you don't overly abrade the enamel of your teeth. You can definitely put too much tension and friction on your teeth. You don't really want to brush your teeth with baking soda. That will abrade the enamel. So the enamel is kind of fragile on your teeth. And I've people have overly damaged their teeth from using too much abrasiveness. So I'm not really sure that calcium hydroxyapatite is the best thing to be using on your teeth. You don't need to like sandblast your teeth. Just a basic toothbrush and water removes plaque. It's just, it's amazing how it does that. I found some toothbrushes that are natural fibers rather than plastic. I don't know how much of the plastic and a toothbrush fiber could break off and become a microplastic, but I try to think about minimizing that so I can get like boar's head bristle toothbrushes. I don't use shampoo. I have short hair, so I can just wash my hair in water. I know there are natural alternatives. I've seen some women doing cool stuff online with apple cider vinegar, egg yolks, and some other girl stuff. I don't know that they put in their hair. But yeah, so I'm a pretty simple man. Um, I think the men out there will understand. The women will probably think, I can't do that. But I think you can probably do more than you think. I, um, I use sunscreen in Costa Rica, but it's a personal prototype sunscreen of a brand that I'm building. It's just tallow and zinc that I use on my face when I'm surfing. A lot of sunscreen has seed oils in it. You don't want to put seed oils on your skin. Nor do I want octocrylenes, octabenzone, avabenzone, and all these sunscreen components that can get absorbed through the skin into the body. I think spray on sunscreen is a travesty and should be illegal because I don't want to have to inhale your sunscreen just like I don't want to inhale your cigarette smoke. It's basically the same thing. Probably equally bad for me as your cigarette smoke. So <clears throat> in terms of skincare, it's what I eat. I don't do it. I don't wash my face. Uh, I don't do it. I don't have to do it. I... I think that some people get worried about it. I think you can put tallow on your skin. Um, the same skincare companies in the works, we're going to develop a tallow face balm. I think animal fats work great on the skin. Pure tallow is a little greasy, so we're going to have to combine it with some other things. Pure butter is a little greasy on the skin, doesn't absorb real well, so we'll get it so that's more absorbent. But animal fats on the skin work great for skincare. I don't think people have acne because their skin isn't clean enough. I think they have acne because of the foods they're eating. So 
I, I don't have to use crazy soaps and rinses to clean my face. And, you know, I'm sweating and outside and in the ocean all day. And I usually just use water when I shower and I don't, I don't scrub the heck out of it or do anything crazy. I don't, I don't have a crazy skincare routine. Um, it's pretty simple. I think it's overly complicated for a lot of people. And, you know, I was recently in Los Angeles, did a podcast with a really amazing woman who has lost a lot of weight and then also has a skincare journey and was talking to her about cutting out vegetables from her diet. I think that'll help with acne. Ironically, um, people fear milk when it comes to acne, but I think it's the pasteurized kind that generally triggers the acne, not the, not the raw milk. So I think skin care is really interesting and that it starts with what you eat. It's foundationally what you eat. And if you have skin issues, think really hard about what you eat and maybe you don't have to worry so much about all the things that you're putting on your face. Wow, that's incredible how little you do and, and your skin looks great. Your teeth look really white. So whatever you're doing is working. The part I'm particularly fascinated with is the teeth, only using water and a toothbrush to clean them. How long have you been doing that? And have you had any cavities or any signs of decay there? Last time I had a cavity was when I was a vegan. So maybe 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, no, there's no, I don't have veneers or any teeth replacements, you know, like all the teeth are mine. Um, no, I think that tooth health is about fat soluble vitamins and even, even eating fruit and honey. I think that the immune system in your teeth, these odontocytes, these, these actual immune cells that live in the teeth can handle all of that. If you're getting enough fat soluble vitamins, when we know that vitamin K2 is critical, vitamin D, these are critical for healthy teeth and bones. It's a lot of what we eat and how we live. This is Weston A. Price, you know, 101. You look at people all over the world, this dentist from the 1940s, there's incredible pictures in his books, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration of huge, broad smiles and, you know, indigenous people that don't even brush their teeth at all. Big, strong jaws and big smiles. And I think that that's just the absence of processed foods and lots of animal foods to get those nutrients. But yeah, I think toothpaste is overrated. Obviously fluoride, I'm not a fan of fluoride at all. I think there's compelling evidence in both animals and humans that fluoride is harmful at a number of different levels. Even the natural toothpaste, quote unquote, without fluoride is going to have polyethylene glycol or soaps or fragrances, things which are abrasive, which can abrade the enamel. We get used to wanting our breath to smell like toothpaste when in fact it's okay for your breath just to smell like human breath. Like people are still going to want to kiss you if your breath just smells like a human. Um, you don't have to worry about that. If you do have bad breath, it's usually coming from your gut and not your mouth, though it can be your mouth, but that population of bacteria in your mouth is from your gut. So that's dysbiosis in your gut, which is again, probably connected with your diet and fixable with dietary changes. When I was in college, no, when I was in medical school, no, PA school, this is my late twenties. I remember I was going on a date with a girl and I had Listerine. I had a Listerine phase. I mean, Listerine seems great until you actually look at the data with it, how bad it is for humans. But it's just, you know, it's this minty, like alcohol blitz for your mouth. You feel like you're just killing everything. I remember walking out of the house and my parents were just like, whoa, your mouth smells way too much like Listerine. And I thought, it's cool. I'm good. But now we know that when you do that, when you bomb your mouth with mouthwash, you're killing all these nitric oxide producing bacteria in the mouth. And there's been a lot of talk recently about data that people who use mouthwash before they work out, like actually decrease their muscle gains from working out. You get less, significantly less benefits from working out if you use mouthwash before you work out. So like you want these gut flora, you want these bacteria in your mouth that produce nitric oxide, you just want healthy populations. But I shudder to think about how much Listerine that I use in the past. Well, Paul, as you talk about this story from back in the day going on this date, it gets me thinking about you and, and the future for you with, you know, getting married, having a family. It's not something I've seen you post about. Is that Obviously, uh, certain things need to align and it's not totally in your control, but is is getting married and having a family a goal for you down the line? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a goal for me. I mean, I'm single, never been married, no kids, but living in Costa Rica makes me think about how cool it would be to raise children here, kind of in the jungle, in nature, all these things. And yeah, I think about it a lot. I think that in some ways I'm grateful that I'm still single because I'm 
probably significantly older than the average person who's never been married before. But at the same time, hopefully I've had time to kind of refine what I'm looking for in a partner. And I think I have a pretty good sense of that now. And uh, yeah, I think when it, when it, when it happens, it'll, it'll be good. And I'm really excited to raise some wild kids in the jungle in Costa Rica and feed them lots of meat and organ fruit. Yeah. Right on. Well, Paul, it's been fun to catch up. There was a lot of big areas that had changed since we last talked and we got to really get in there and hash them out. We're going to link up your book. We're going to link up your website, social media, everything in the show notes. And I've just really enjoyed following your journey and your evolution and the fact that you've been so upfront as you've continued to pivot. And I just want to honor you and and thank you for being so open to change and, and to sharing that journey with all of us. And thank you for coming on the show. It's great, man. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here with you. And uh, yeah, I'm glad that people benefit from what I'm putting out there. I hope it's helpful for people and I'm excited to keep doing it because, you know, I'm pretty, my cup is overflowing because I get to surf every day and I live in Costa Rica and I've got a great community. And so I'm just excited to keep making educational stuff that's beneficial for people. And thank you for helping me get this to more people so that they can think about things and be curious and hopefully benefit from all of it. So I appreciate you too. Thanks, man. Thank you. Let's do it again sometime. Of course, anytime. Now that you're done my conversation with Paul, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dr. Lustig. He's got a unique perspective on insulin resistance. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. Ultimately, it's not what's in the food. It's what's been done to the food that matters. Everything fructose does to the mitochondria. 